Welcome to the Speak Up channel. In today's lesson, you'll delve into a series of brief conversations meticulously crafted to enhance your proficiency in understanding spoken English. Our aim is to gauge your current level of comprehension. The most effective means of advancing your English skills lies in a combination of attentive listening and immersive reading. Our aspiration is to see you conversing fluently, akin to a native speaker. We're eager to boost your comprehension abilities, so let's dive into these conversations together and take a step closer to fluency in English. And of course, let's speak like a native. Radio powered by your own sweat hints at Future of Wearables. Battery flat on your radio? Don't sweat it. Or maybe that's exactly what you should do. Sweat alone has been used to power a radio for two days, demonstrating the capability of a new skin patch. The patch is a flexible square just a couple of centimeters across that sticks to skin. It contains enzymes that replace the precious metals normally used in batteries and feed off sweet to provide power. Getting enough power out of a biofuel cell to make it useful has proved tricky, but the latest version can extract ten times more than before. We're now getting really impressive power levels. If you were out for a run, you would be able to power a mobile device, says Joseph Wang at the University of California, San Diego, who was in the team that worked on the technology. So what is a digital nomad? A digital nomad is someone who isn't confined by office space, office attire, or office politics. They can work wherever they want as long as they have an internet connection. There are no set hours, often no boss, and you don't have to call in sick to skip work because you want to go wakeboarding, knowing that you'll happily pull an all-nighter tomorrow to make up for it. Digital nomads make their money online through blogging, affiliate marketing, social media, ebooks, coaching, and a host of other ingenious methods. We're location independent, and we love it. If the monotonous routine is getting you down, if you look back at your last five years and think, what have I actually done in that time, then it's time to shake it up. A kiss for every taste. A guide to the greeting that's better than a handshake. If there's one thing that can be disconcerting when you're traveling around Latin America, it's the custom of greeting people with a kiss. Really, is there anything more uncomfortable than kissing a total stranger? That's what a lot of Argentines do, finding it perfectly acceptable to plant one or even two kisses on the cheek of someone who they've just met. Going cheek to cheek is increasingly common between Argentine men, even if they've never laid eyes on each other before. On the other side of the Andes, in Chile, a kiss on the cheek is also customary. But beware, only one and only between women. Chilean men shake hands, but if they are already friends, first comes the handshake and then a hug. Nice. The social mores of other cultures are a minefield of possible embarrassments, but they are also a constant source of fascination. Life expectancy can vary by 20 years, based on where in the U.S. You live long life is a gift that has never been democratically distributed. You may die young or old, and it's impossible to know in your first years just when your last ones will come. A new study from JAMA Internal Medicine shows, however, that one of the biggest X factors may be simple geography. Where you live may play a powerful role in when you'll die. While it's never been much of a secret that people living in countries in the developed world live longer, on average, than people in the developing world. The new study focused on the U.S. alone. Here, the investigators found striking differences within the country. Over the course of the 24 years spanned by the study, life expectancy increased by 5.3 years nationwide, from 73.8 to 79.1. Women, whose lifespan increased from 77.5 to 81.5, lived longer than men, with a boost from 70 to 76.7, but both sexes saw improvements. Locally, however, there were enormous gaps. The longest-lived regions were the wealthier ones. 
counties in central Colorado had the highest life expectancies, and Summit County, Colorado, had the highest in the country at 86 years. Several counties in central Alaska and various spots along the two coasts had the largest gains in life expectancy. This passage about thiamine comes from multiple medical and scientific publications. One of the risks of alcoholism is depletion of nutrients like thiamine and folic acid. Thiamine, found in foods such as cereals, lean meats, dairy products, fruit and eggs, is needed to regulate the body's metabolism. Depletion of thiamine can lead to the development of Wernicke's syndrome, a condition characterized by severe confusion, lack of balance, and paralysis of certain eye muscles. Folic acid helps in the synthesis of the cell's genetic material and maturation of certain blood cells, and deficiency can lead to anemia. These vitamin deficiencies are thought to be caused not only by poor diet, but also by alcohol-induced damage to the digestive tract. Recognizing these risks, scientists in Great Britain have proposed medicating beer by adding thiamine to it. They claim fortification of beer or other alcohol would be among the most direct measures yet taken to address problems associated with alcohol abuse. Supporters point out that in addition to helping heavy drinkers avoid certain diseases, such a measure could reduce the burgeoning national health care bill. Additionally, they argue that fortifying food products is hardly unprecedented. They point out, for example, that bakers routinely add thiamine to bread to make up for its loss during production. However, the proposal is not without its detractors. Brewers, pub owners, and drinkers' organizations tend to oppose the move. Among their concerns is that supplements could change the taste of beer. Some even suggest that to add vitamins to beer might encourage more people to drink too much in the mistaken belief that if one beer is good for you, ten beers are better. In this part, you will hear three short segments from a radio program. The program is called Learning from the Experts. You will hear what three different radio guests have to say about three different topics. Each talk lasts about three minutes. Of course, none of us were around to witness the extinction of the dinosaurs, but scientists say that unless something is done to halt the spread of a disease, we may see the extinction of the frog. Peter Reynolds reports. Pollution. Habitat destruction. Climate change. Scientists believe that these are some of the factors that have contributed to the dramatic decline in frog populations around the world. Many species of frogs are not just threatened with, but are already close to, extinction. And frogs face yet another threat, an aquatic fungus that infects their skin. This fungus is accelerating the decline of the worldwide frog population. Biologist Robert Murray is here to tell us more. That's right, Peter. It's a skin disease called chytrid fungus, which coats a frog's skin. This reduces a frog's ability to absorb water, so frogs become ill and can eventually die from dehydration. Scientists speculate that this fungus began spreading globally as early as the 1930s, when researchers first shipped the African clawed frog around the world for medical uses. This African species, however, is immune to the fungus. So scientists believe that the fungus on the African frog started attacking frog populations that weren't immune. Many zoos are helping to combat the problem by starting captive breeding programs. This involves a zoo cleaning its frogs with an antifungal wash and then isolating them in order to prevent the possible spread of the fungus. The zoos will eventually return these uncontaminated frogs to their natural habitats. But scientists have yet to determine how to stop the spread of chytrid fungus in the wild. And that's what is really needed. It's encouraging that there's a conservation plan, but it looks like a solution needs to be found for eradicating the fungus in the wild before these healthy zoo frogs can be released. Is there anything else that can be done in the meantime? 
humans do contribute to the spread of this fungus, so it's vital that we do our part. It'll take international cooperation because each country must put strict quarantine procedures in place. That is, holding frog shipments between different countries until they know the frogs are healthy and tightly controlling the shipment of frogs around the world. Governments need to enforce laws so we can be in the best position to stop the spread of chytrid fungus. Saving the frog is not just some cute, feel-good cause. Frogs, all amphibians, are critical to maintaining balance in the world's ecosystems. This is because they're vital to the control of insects in tropical regions. Furthermore, those insects can cause diseases in humans. So, by saving the frog, we are ultimately helping to save ourselves. Listeners interested in learning more about the zoos participating in the program to save frogs from the chytrid fungus should visit our website. As Dr. Murray said, we need to do our part, so please consider making a donation to an animal conservation group. Instructions are available on the website. We hope you have enjoyed our program. Subscribe for more helpful content and come to learn English with us.